All right, welcome to this edition of the Whole Roofing and Remodeling Podcast. Today we got two special guests from the Indiana FFA um, State Officers, Jaden Mays and Anthony Taylor. So, hey guys, welcome. Uh, I'm going to give you guys the floor. Introduce yourself. Give us a couple fun facts. Um, your local high school, all that kind of stuff. Awesome. You start. Okay. Um, so my name is Jaden Mays. Uh, like Bob said, I grew up in Thorntown, Indiana. Um, so right near Lebanon, graduated from Western Boone. Um, as far as, I'll go ahead and go into my ag background. As far as ag background goes, um, my family uh, farms about a thousand acres of corn and soybeans um, in Thorntown. Um, that's on my grandpa's side. And then I also uh, dabbled into the dairy business a little bit in high school as well. Worked on a small dairy farm um, for a family uh, in Thorntown as well. And that kind of prompted me to get involved in the FFA. Um, as far as my FFA experience, I would say that it was the leadership that really pulled me in. Obviously, I was passionate about agriculture, but um, just the professional development the organization has to offer is kind of what um, really prompted me to join, um, and I haven't looked back. So glad to be at this level, at the, the state position that we are in. It's an incredible opportunity. Um, and then after this year, I'll be headed to Purdue to study ag econ with a law focus. So long-term career goal, I do want to end up in D.C. working in ag policy. And like Bob said, I'm Anthony Taylor, currently serving as the state treasurer for Indiana FFA. And I grew up in Warsaw, Indiana, and went to Warsaw Community High School. And unlike Jaden and some of my other teammates, I had a completely different background when it comes to agriculture. Grew up in a totally non-ag background, uh, lived in a suburb, suburban uh, neighborhood my whole life, and didn't really have that connection with ag like most of them do, but still found my spot and niche in um, in FFA and really found it through welding and that's where my passion is and plan on going to Kentucky Welding Institute after state office um, starting in January. So sticking to that trades route and not really wanting to go to college is kind of what my passion is and glad to be here. Man, guys, I mean seriously, so just kind of a just a little bit of a, um, a background update here. Um, we took our entire team a month ago or so, um, went down and we hung gutters um, on all the buildings at the Indiana FFA Center. And they needed them. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, as, as a company, you guys hear us talk about legacy, give back, and that kind of stuff. So it was, uh, we just had a team retreat and we were talking about, we wanted to give, a, we wanted to do one kind of, one give back as a team once a quarter. And it's easier for me to write a check, if I'm honest, but what the team gets out of taking in the day, putting their hands, helping you guys, like, you know. So I met um, these two uh, wonderful individuals and the other five, correct? Mm -hmm. There's yep. seven state officers, and they work side by side with us all morning. So that was a lot of fun. So that's why we brought them in, you know. And, and I love to hear that because I had known that some of them had a complete bag ag ground, some don't. And I look back, even even from rural Rush County when I was in FFA, um, you, know, and I, you know what I know how old I feel. Um, <laughs> earlier this week, we were at a senior, uh, a high school event where all the seniors were at. It was an ex, oh my gosh, opportunity expo. And they, um, the kids told me they graduated. I'm sorry. They were born the year that I graduated. Oh, that's crazy. I was like, that make you feel old yeah. real quick. So, yeah. but anyway, so we got to, we got to hang out with you guys, but you know, let's just kind of talk a little bit about that. Like you, you want to get into trades because there's absolutely nothing wrong with going to college. But then again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with going to trades or going right into the workforce. Because one thing that I hate is I feel like we put so much pressure on 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds to know what they want to do for the rest of their life. And I'm 36, and I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up, you know. So, but no, I mean, all seriousness, let's just kind of talk about, like, what got you into welding um, and, you know, kind of what your further plans is with that. Yeah, so um, FFA was honestly what kicked it off. My freshman year, um, my advisor was like, hey, there's like a welding contest with FFA. Like, do you want to try it? And I was like, well, I've never welded before. He goes, well, it doesn't matter. Like, we have an instructor who's going to come and teach you, um, and you're going to really enjoy it. I was like, okay, I guess I'll go. And so I went to a couple practices with one of my buddies, and just when I struck my first rod, I was like, this is awesome. Like, this is like fire right in front of me, and I yep. can do this. Like, this is cool. Um, and then it stuck with me to my junior year. Um, I continued on, and then I actually took the welding class that they offered at my high school. 
And so my junior and senior year, I took this welding class, and I had the opportunity my junior year to go down to Kentucky Welding Institute um, for a welding contest. And at the time, I wasn't no, I wasn't the best welder, but it was still really cool to get out there and experience that. Aside from like an FFA contest, like it was cool to go to something else, especially like an all welding contest, because the atmosphere is completely different. The people that are there um, are all excited about welding, and like that's what the whole conversations are with everybody. And they had like vendors and stuff. Um, and I got to talk to a lot of the educators at the school there, and I was like, this is really what I want to do. Um, senior year, I went back, same welding contest. Actually, when we were running for state office, mm-hmm. uh, we had an executive committee meeting on Friday. The welding contest was Saturday, and then we had our state officer open house on Sunday. And uh, after the exec meeting, I drove three hours to Kentucky. It was like 12 o'clock at night when I got there. I woke up like 6 in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, like woke up, went to the school, uh, I was in like the second heat or whatever, went welded, um, passed out my buddy's dad's truck for like three hours, woke back up, realized I got fourth place and they got me a, they gave me a $5,500 scholarship for it and then drove back up to Trafalgar for the, <laughs> for the open house. But, um, my passion really started with FFA and that's why I was just like, this is what I want to do. You know, and what I love about that is so many people still think that FFA stands for Future Farmers of America. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, is there importance of educating the people about their food and where their food comes from? Absolutely, because there's such that negativity that all these rich farmers are out poisoning everybody <laughs> yeah. to kill them off. Um, and I don't want to get political. It's not the rich farmers. It's the it's the politicians. But we won't we won't go there today. Um, but I mean, but that's that is so cool because now that you're you're going into something that you can enjoy. A B, you can make really good money, mm-hmm. provide for your family. Um, all that. I mean, that's that is what's so awesome about FFA is the opportunities, and it's just not you know, and it's just not. You know, livestock judging or dairy judging, which I done livestock judging. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know, you can either take that your welding skills, your leadership skills, and end up running your own welding company. You know, that's what's awesome for me. Like I've, I, I contribute so much of my fundamental background to FFA 4-H. But my dad just he's like, hey, you guys, you're gonna do that. I was livestock judging when I was third grade. I was given reasons, <laughs> which if people don't understand what reasons is, like you have to judge a class of steers or heifers or pigs or sheep, and then you have to stand in front of somebody and tell them why you placed them the way you did. Even if it's completely wrong. Correct. <laughs> and you, most of the time, it's the guy that owns the freaking animals. Yeah. So you yeah. really have to know how to word things so you don't just totally like say, hey, your first place steer is pretty good steer. The last one sucks. Like, you <laughs> yeah. know, um, so... But there's so much value in that of me being able to stand up in front of my team and talk or me to deal with a customer that's upset. or ha- I mean, it's just the communication skills that I learned at such a young age. Um, and then it just kind of it snowballs. Like you'll look back and you'll be like, holy cow, like when you stepped out of your comfort zone to go to that first meeting, like, yeah, your buddy went with you, so that was easier. But you just never know how that's going to inspire somebody. And especially, I don't even know, do you guys know the statistics in FFA, like how many have like a connection to ag and how many that don't in Indiana? I don't think we know. Sorry, yeah, actually, those, at least I don't. No, you're good. I wouldn't, I don't know. Um, on a national level, I would have to guess, at, at the rate we're going, I could definitely see like half and half, to right. be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, and Or maybe even like... More. I guarantee yeah, you that maybe the, more. I guarantee yeah. you the percentage of kids that their family's full time income comes from the farm it, yes. is uh, very, it's very, very, very slow. little. I yeah. mean, like yeah. my dad, he we did hay and cattle growing up. You know, we raised bucket calves, butchered, you know, fed out, mm-hmm. um, sold them to freezer beef and stuff like that. You know, hay and straw and cattle. You know, so and that was just always that was just a part time side gig. Mm-hmm. So, but so yeah, I mean, like I said. That's what a lot of people don't realize with FFA it is way more than just farming. And that's a big part of it, don't get me wrong. But, like, we need people like you out advocating in Washington, you know, whatever whatever that is. And, you know what, we need strong leaders in a welding field. Because one thing that people don't understand that you guys will really understand is, like, in a couple years, there's a trust with in people that were in FFA 
like you may go for a job in a couple of years and you'd be like the guy be like you're a state officer yeah like holy cow like he has his crap together yeah. like you know and that's one thing whenever i was at that opportunity expo with them uh, high schoolers part of my speech was hey guys do the little things show up early stay late do what you say you're going to do and stay off your phone. Like, unfortunately, there's so many kids that can't even look people in the eyes and have a conversation yeah. or extend their hand out for a handshake. And it's like, you know, you do them little things, like you're going to set yourself up so far, you know, ahead in life. So tell us a little bit more about kind of like a little bit of your FFA um, experience mm-hmm. and then kind of what led you into um, wanting to be, you know, with the – with the ag economics end of, you know, kind of the lobbiness. Yeah. I don't know if that's a word or not, but I kind of make words <laughs> The lob- lobbyness. No, there you that's, go. that's a good, uh, good way to put it. Um, so, like I said, started FFA um, out of the passion that I had for agriculture, but it was primarily the leadership that pulled me into it. Um, I was very big into prepared public speaking, so we, we talk about communication. Um, with that contest, you have to write – um, when you get to the like the sophomore level and up, you have to write a six to eight minute speech. You memorize the entire thing, um, and then you get it give it in a front of a set of judges. And so this past year, I was able to work my way up to the national level. That was the first time I'd ever been to a national contest, um, and I ended up placing fourth in the entire nation. So. I mean, that was an incredible experience, just being down there at the convention center in Indy. Um, and I'm speaking in front of, gosh, I don't know, at least a few hundred people, but the audience is pretty big. Um, and, you know, I get, get up there, and I've spent years, I mean, working on this speech and preparing for it. And so that was always my big contest. Um, as far as leadership positions, um, going back to my chapter, I was president of my chapter for a couple of years, and then I uh, was a district officer for a couple of years as well, and then worked my way up to the state level. I think I always knew that I wanted to do state office. Like, I remember as far back as my eighth grade year being like, I want to work my way up to that level. I'm a naturally curious person, so it's kind of just pushing myself to see how far can I go. Like, I just want to see how far I can actually um, go with this. And so grateful to be here. It's been an incredible opportunity to talk about, like, you know, working up your confidence to look people in the eye or, you know, have that handshake. Um, I've always heard that when you go to apply for a job, like people look, especially colleges, and even in college might not be the way for you, but they look for FFA members because we have those skills. We provide those skills that this country desperately needs. Um, and so I think career wise, um, I, I didn't know, and I still don't know exactly what I want to do, but I always knew that I wanted to do something in the public eye, advocate for something, especially doing prepared public speaking. That's just a passion of mine. Um, and I think probably the later half of my high school career, I started getting really into the, the policy side of things because I was like, you know, when you take everything back, um, you know, everything starts with policy, education, your guys' jobs, you know, well, everything starts with policy. And if we don't have good lawmakers, if we don't have good policy, then that's going to affect everything else. It's just a trickle effect from what happens in D.C. on a federal level. So that's where my passion is. Um, and I might, you know, my main goal is to work in ag policy. I don't think I want to lobby. Like, I hate asking people for money or whatever. I want to do something. I think I want to be on the policy writing side where I'm writing the legislation or at least influencing the legislation that happens. Um, I could definitely see myself being a big part in the farm bill, Mm -hmm. um, things like that that happen on a federal level. So I, I know you have to start small. I might try to work like up to the state level first and then move out to D.C., but whether it's something where I'm traveling back and forth between Indiana and, and there, um, that's definitely where I see myself. So We'll see. Fingers crossed. So, uh, what, what happens in the next few years? Well, we, we always joke that Jane's going to be the president one day, and we'll all be on, <laughs> we'll all be on our staff again. Yeah. I don't think yeah. I'll be president, but I dream job would be the secretary of agriculture for the U.S. What is your FFA? Uh, what is your state officer position? A sentinel. Sentinel. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. I was sentinel uh, my sophomore year at the chap- chapter level. Um, something else. Let's talk about like um, kind of like. 
you know, I think there's nobody that can talk about FFA and not talk about their FFA advisor. Um, I saw Mr. Orm last night. Um, his <laughs> wife actually teaches um, a preschool that my kids go to, and my youngest one had her program last night, and he, he you know, stopped by to, to watch it and support his wife, you know. Um, and what a lot of people – one thing I feel like the older you get, the more mature you get, you realize, like, how much support – anything takes like even just at our small roofing business like you look at the support staff that that we have um and the workers like i mean you know there's 14 of us here that works every single day and then we have realistically any between 10 like today we've got at a minimum that i know my wife does all the scheduling um five crews working right now so there's between 30 to 40 subcontractors working right now so right now technically there's about 50 people working under me today you know and you just you realize for us to do the volume that we do like how many actually set of hands that takes and once again like for you to have the opportunity to just be a chapter officer like your parents have to give up stuff you know um, have to really support you know then districts even more than state, you know, and then, you know, that's the only way that you ever got to participate in the national, you know, um, event, you know, and, and look back at like the volunteers that come in to listen to you speak, you know, the community members, you know, livestock judging, like how many, I was actually just talking to somebody yesterday about the guy that I started, Carl Hilton, uh, rest in peace. He's been gone several years now, but like, he, we would get in his, he'd pick us up at freaking six o'clock, five o'clock on Saturday morning, and we would go. It's funny you said Western Boone because that's where you're from. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm pretty confident. Did they normally have a, a livestock in the, in, invitational? Um, yes, okay. they do. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like that was one that we always went to. Mm-hmm. So they when have, you said Western Boone. They usually have one at the, the fairgrounds there, at the okay. county fairgrounds yep. in Lebanon. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, um, so like instantly, like, you know, I I follow that. So kind of like, you know, tell us a little bit about like, you know, once again, like you guys, you donate, I don't know how you say it. You pledge a year to the Indiana FFA. Like, you know, you can't work a job, correct? Yeah, we can. You you can? Can't. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, and that, that's another thing. Like, and I was telling the team when we came out to do the gutters, I'm like, guys, these are seven individuals that at at their end of their senior year, decided that they were going to pledge their time the next year to give back to tens of thousands of kids uh, in the in the Indiana FFA. Like that takes a level of maturity that a lot of people don't, because a lot of us at eighteen are like, "I'm going to go enjoy my summer," or <laughs> "I'm going to go to college to party," or whatever yeah. that is. So, just talk a little bit about you know um, a little bit of the sacrifice, um, you know, because that's another thing in life. Um, nobody wants to talk about the hard work. Everybody wants to see that we do a podcast now and that I have, you know, freaking 12 or 14 vehicles out on the road every day with my name, but they forget about the time that I'm praying for a check to hit the freaking mailbox when I get home today so I can get everybody paid by the end of the week, you know, kind of thing. So, So, I mean, it kind of, it starts back to your advisor, honestly, like within the organization, like they sacrifice like their family time, the time they spend with people um, that they love and care about to spend that time with us. And then in turn, uh, it obviously takes like a hard work from like your team. Like if you have a judging team, like to go and participate and do well, it takes a lot of time from their families to, you know, make sure that they're doing, you know, what they need to go to hopefully win state or win that area contest so they can advance the state. And so like sacrifice has always been something that's, pretty embedded in the organization but it's honestly like unnoticed because it's just like that servant heart that most fa members have it's just like all right we're willing to take that up and we're willing to do that to make sure that like our chapter and our community can succeed and so like for me like going into welding contests and like taking the hours away from like maybe doing homework and having to push it out later or um even just spending the time with my family like it took a lot of work to really get to where I've been and obviously like going to national contests like that's totally like different um but I placed like seventh in the state for a welding contest and it took a lot of work to really get there but it's always something that you know our organization really holds true to is you know we we got to put other people first and like we we have to have that servant heart 
Um, and that's something that's just awesome about the FFA and the organization as a whole. Well, and that's just something this country needs more of. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not it's not all about, you know, everybody wants it to be about me, 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 mm-hmm. you know. Um, want to talk about me. Wanna yeah, talk there about you go. I. So we're going to talk <laughs> some karaoke before this is over with. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, like, you know, if you um, – Kind of the buzzword is like always bring more value, mm-hmm. you know, give value. Like we literally, like that's that's our whole entire like marketing thing is like bring value to our customer. Like show them, you know, educate them on why this product is the best or whatever that is. But yeah, um, yeah, you know, bring the value. So uh, give a shout out to your FFA advisor if you want to. Uh, Mr. Jacob Riley. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Great yeah. guy. How long has he been doing it? Um, that's a great question. So he started at Oregon Davis before he went to uh, Plymouth, and then he went from Plymouth to Warsaw. But I think he's been in it f- for like 10 or 15 years. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm yeah, not like exactly this, sure, but like I said, that maybe is, even longer, but that is that is the real sac- like you said, they're sacrificed to the time they give, but their family of you know the hours that you know the the hours that I know Mr. Orm puts in to the FFA, and what a lot of people don't realize is like you know, a our teachers don't get enough credit, all of our teachers, um, and unfortunately, we all had that teacher that was just there for the check. Yeah. However, yeah. so many of them are not. But then on top of the FFA, like, that's a freaking 12-month year program. Like, there's really no... They don't get a vacation. Like, yeah. 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 I mean, it's like with with ours, like, you know, it's state convention being at the end of June, or middle of the end of June. Um, yeah, there's a... July may slow down a hair, but then school starts back in August, and it's back to the races, you know, here at the end of the year, it's... You know, banquets, which is a big to do, and then they've got to be getting ready for you know their state contest and, oh, yeah. and state convention. So, Jaden, um, kind of give a shout out to your advisor um, and uh, just talk a little bit about that sacrifice. Yeah, mine was uh, Travis Terhar, which he just got a new job, so he's not at our school anymore. But um, he was there from the start of my career um, until the end. Um, And, yeah, I think it just goes back kind of what you were talking about, the sacrifice, um, the hours that they put in behind the scenes. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but most advisors for the FFA work don't get paid, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Unless they get a stipend. I think it depends on the school. Like, some make it like a stipend. Some make it a little bit of a stipend, but it'd be like if if I hired you to work about for about probably 50 cents an hour. Yeah. So, yeah. like I said, they, they don't do it for the money. <laughs> it's not, like, it, it's literally, it's not much at all. And so I just think um, from any ag advisor, any FFA advisor, any standpoint, like, it's a lot of work that goes on. Um, and just to, you know, they're, they're taking hours away from their family or whatever it is. Um, and sometimes they view those kids like their own. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I just went to a banquet um, at Sheridan, and the advisor, he was standing up there, and, like, you know, this is a, I don't know how old he is, 55, 60-year-old man, and he was, like, choked up over mm-hmm. the fact that he, like, said, these kids, like, are everything to me, and he, like, I, I could tell that he was almost, like, in tears over it. So they really do um, care a lot, and I always look at it just from my, my standpoint, wanting to go out to D.C. and everything. Like, teachers are the ones that, like they have the future in their hands. Like they have the future of these kids in their hands. They're the ones teaching these, um, you know, students to be the best person that they can be. And so, yeah, we owe a lot to our teachers. I don't think they're appreciated as near as much as they should be. But as far as FFA goes, ag advisors, they're they're they sacrifice a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like I say, you know, one thing I'm part of a revolt. A revolt. Um, a mastermind called Revolt, it's a bunch of ro- mainly roofing business owners. And, you know, we talk about legacy. And one thing that we always say is impact over income. Um, Zig Ziglar is a big leadership guy that most people know. You know, he, he's got a famous quote out there that says, if you help enough people, you'll never have to worry about money. Um, you know, and but what I look at is like, how can I... How is my legacy going to be? Like, I want to look at, like, I look at one of the sales reps that just came on full board. He's got a stepson, Joey. He calls him his son, Joey. Um, But, like, the opportunities that I give his dad, his stepdad, 
like is going to affect him that's going to affect his kids. And Joey's kids, I mean, Joey's four. His kids will never know my name. However, like, part of my legacy will live through them kids. And, and like, you know, but look back. Like, who are you going to affect welding? Who are you going to affect in in Washington? Um, that goes back to your parents, your your FFA advisor, the volunteers that helped listen to you. Like, I mean, that... That that is what's life. That is what life is about. Like genuinely helping people um, and making a difference. Because you know, it's just. It, and, and some people don't get it, but the people that get it, like they get it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just like holy cow. And you want to be around people like that. You don't want to be around people that it's all about me, 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 me. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, now we're back to that song yeah, again. You about know. Me. So, but it's like you know, like listen to people like. You know, the saying you got two ears and one mouth, you know, Mm -hmm. listen twice as much as you talk, you know. And um, so, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Um, I guess talk about um, I'll start with probably my favorite thing uh, when I was in FFA uh, was was either soil judging or livestock judging. Um, So uh, I'll ask you guys kind of to talk about, you know, what what yours was uh, that kind of tied with me just because I showed uh, in 4-H beef and dairy, um, so mainly more beef towards the end of my 4-H career. But looking back, that was that was probably my favorite thing. One funny story is you know for Rushville they always did the um, creed contest. Creed contest is the FFA creed, and it was a contest for freshmen or green, uh, technically green hands first year <laughs> members. Yeah. And, you know, I remember sitting there at our Green Inn initiation, and me and my buddy, we didn't do the, the Creed speaking contest. And people would get up there and, like, and it's been a little while, so I don't remember everything perfectly. But I remember a couple of people, like, starting it, crying, not even finishing it. Mm-hmm. Me and my buddy, we're sitting back there, and we're, like, repeating it word for word for word. And uh, we were both being raised by our dads um, at that um and on our entire lives, actually, but both of our dads were ready to kick our, you know, what <laughs> because we weren't up there doing it. Um, and which is, it's a lot easier to sit back and watch somebody yeah. standing up there, you know. So that is that is one thing, you know, that I, uh, I guess you always look back and like, yeah, you should have, we should have got pushed a little more about this. But you know, I mean, at the end of the day. The judging, um, but I also feel like that has helped me so much in my sales career, um, and also now running the business because now I went from selling you on buying a roof to now I've got to sell people to come and work for me. So I've just got a bigger sales position now in the grand scheme of things. So just like you said, to be to be able to talk to somebody, look them in the eye, ask good questions, you know that kind of stuff. So share with whatever, um, whatever, whatever your favorite, you know event was i can start (laughs) um so prepared uh whenever that um but i'll touch on i would say my favorite experience i know not to get off track but um we talked about the the servant heart um so when covid hit my we would have been sophomores in high school Mm -hmm. Um, my, uh, one, one of the girls in my chapter, it feels like so long ago. Um, one of the girls in my chapter had this idea to do a community service project. Um, and so what we ended up doing over the course of an entire year, we raised like nearly $30,000 and for an entire year, we would buy local meat and dairy products from farmers and then donate them back to food pantries across our entire County. So I think at the highest, uh, we were at eight food pantries, but it lasted for a really good while. Um, and so I would say, as far as my FFA career goes, I probably got the most out of that. It wasn't because I gained a lot of skills. I, I did, but it was because I gave back. Um, and so that was probably um, the, the biggest thing that I remember um, being in my chapter because we were filling that gap. You know, you had farmers where you know they they were dumping milk down the drain all of the restaurants had shut down all of the schools had shut down so they had nowhere to give their products and so if we could be the one to take their products and then give it to people that were going hungry you know we were wasting all this food and then people were going hungry because everything was shut down so it was kind of a neat way to like 
so kill two birds with one stone you're solving two problems at the same time so that was uh the best thing that i i've done um with my FFA career no and that's that's perfectly fine that, that that you shared that you've talked a lot about your speech what what was your topic i'm just kind of curious yeah uh no my topic was on mental health and agriculture so i spent a majority of my time in high school focusing on that subject i spoke at the state level for 4-h and ffa um with it and then i ended up my senior year of high school would have been first semester uh, got together with some friends and we ended up starting a mental health club at western boone and so mental health was always always a big um big influence in my life um whether it came down to my struggle with it or helping other people with theirs um and uh, after covid so after doing the the campaign the fundraiser that we did with the chapter like I just had a way different outlook on it because you saw, I mean, when you were going to those pantries or working with farmers, you saw that need um, f- to advocate for it. So, yeah, that was the subject. It was over. Um, it literally, I mean, it's changed, changed my life, changed my outlook on life. So a really good resource on that is jo- <laughs> Dr. John Deloney. Um, he actually works for Dave Ramsey, the financial guy that I'm really connected with. Um, but genuinely, like, he's got a podcast. I know the guy. I've had some one-on-one conversations with him. Genuinely a really good dude. And, you know, um, the crazy thing about mental health is I feel like there's, like, two different angles. It's the shut up, don't talk about it, whatever. But then they go off and kill themselves, unfortunately. Or... I want to complain about it. I want to talk about it. I want to dirt. I want to air my dirty laundry, but I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Like in, I guess that kind of comes back to, like as a country, we're just not really good about dealing with our crap. Mm-hmm. Like you know, um, and some of that is you just gotta. Some of it you do have to push through it. Like some days you gotta get up and go for a walk, or not drink soda and drink water or go do a quick workout like that will help. I mean, the problem, and I'm not trying to get down on a rabbit hole. The problem is like the pharmaceutical companies just want to cram this medicine down you. Mm-hmm. So then you have to take it for the next 40 or 50 years of your life. Uh, now I'm not saying that some medication isn't good, but I'm also saying there's a lot of natural things, exercise, whatever that is. Um, that could benefit you long term way more than, you know, than pharmaceuticals because it's just a rabbit hole where it's like, oh, well, now you need these two drugs. Okay, now you're gonna need this one down the road. You know, um, and I try not to get political on this, um, you know, but there is a lot of influence on follow the money, unfortunately. Yeah, you most know? most things go down to diet exercise um and then you look at the way our school systems are built especially for not to pick on boys but like the school system is not built for you guys to sit there for hours on end which is why like and i yeah i'm taking the college route but i wholeheartedly support you know people that want to go into the trades you know anthony like wanting to go into welding and stuff like I mean, you physically using your hands, physical labor, um, and you guys like talk about that. Like you and Seth, I think most of the times it's like the computer work. Yeah, yeah it's okay, but it's all right. wanting to actually go. Got, outside I gotta go outside things. and go fish or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The day. Well, and okay, so like I never know where these podcasts are gonna go, but we're just gonna run with it. You know, you talk about fishing. Like once again, like what did COVID bring? Um, it brought more people wanting to enjoy nature. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's crazy because we're out in the middle of nowhere here and, you know, we're growing a fairly decent sized roofing companies um, for our area. Um, and, you know, some of the guys that I, you know, some a lot of the bigger roofing company, the guys that I'm connected with, they're all towards like Indy and they're like, what, what, what do you live out there? What would you want to live out there for? And then COVID happens and they're like, oh my gosh, like, I think I should live closer, <laughs> closer to you. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, for sure. Like, you know. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, the importance of the mental health or just disconnecting. Like, our phones are an amazing, amazing, amazing tool. Like, me and my wife, like, our company is pretty much ran off of phones practically. You know, we're running a multi-million dollar business off of cell phones. Yeah. But also, that's a good and bad. Because, like, you want to, sometimes you want to record. Like, I just... I got a pond in my backyard. I'm embarrassed to admit this. I've probably fished it 10 times and we've had, I've lived there almost five years. 
and literally like my son is going to turn eight here in a couple of weeks and he i just want to fish and pull for my birthday dad i want to fish and pull for my birthday so we ran in to rule king last saturday night after a job site i had all three kids with me and um i thought i was buying one fishing pole well i bought three fishing poles <laughs> um and we went that was saturday and we ended up fishing saturday night and then sunday my son talked my wife in the going back there to go fishing with him. <laughs> and just like that piece and just his pure enjoyment, you know, uh, you talk about mental health, like there's no drug, there's no pharmaceutical that's going to give you like that kind of adrenaline rush or just calmness and peace, mm-hmm. you know. So, and you know, and like one thing I always say, we talk to, so me and my wife sponsor the Dave Ramsey um, personal finance curriculum. And a lot of them kids are juniors or seniors. And we go there, and like normally the first thing we say is like, guys, what you're going to do with your path, that's perfect. If you want to go to college and you want to go to college, not that your teacher wants you to go or your parents are trying to make you, like if you want to go, go. But if you want to go to trades, go. If you want to go get a job, go get a job. Like, you know, um, life is short. And, I, and, you know, hopefully you guys haven't lost anybody close to you yet of your age. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, the older you get, um, there was a guy that just passed away that I graduated with his sister. Um, that stuff like that starts hitting home when people your age or younger you lose in a weird in in a freak instant. You know um, that like that really opens your opens your mind to like okay like you genuinely got to live today to the fullest. Like there's 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 no reason not to. That's funny because that's like what my whole like banquet speech is about is just like making the most of like life and like really enjoying it. So you almost lost. <laughs> you yeah. So fire. so so actually I went <clears throat> this year. Scary story. I uh, was driving back home to vote and it's like two and a half three hours from Trafalgar to Warsaw. And I'm driving on State Road 13, and I drove it hundreds and hundreds of times before, either coming to the center, going back, going to family, whatever. Um, And I'm just driving and just listening to music, whatever, just relaxing. And I get a Snapchat, and like you say, phones can be a good thing and a bad thing. I get a Snapchat, and I I reach down, I grab my phone, I look at it, and um, I'm just, like, responding to it. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm no longer on the road, I'm in the ditch. And I look to my left, and it's pretty steep, and I honestly don't really realize I didn't feel that grade change. So uh, it was pretty steep, so I couldn't just pull myself back up. And then to my right, there was a cemetery with, like, a fence row around it, and I couldn't go that way because I would have taken out the fence in the cemetery. And right ahead was a culvert with, like, a concrete pillar. And I I smoked that thing, rolled my car. It was awful. But I, I walked away with just, like, my shoulder was, like, a little sore, and that was it. Like, I was, it was... A pretty pretty scary moment, but it's a great story to like tell people like consequences of like actions are greater than what you realize, yep. and so you need to be a lot more mindful of like those actions and really make the most of like what you're doing. Well, and I mean, <clears throat> you really can't you really can't say it any better than that. Um, one thing that I'm working on as a company thing is be more conscious, like what you're doing, um, and like we all. It's, kind of hard to explain but it's like you either think with your head or your heart and who you are when you're talking or thinking with your heart that's genuinely who you are Mm -hmm. when you're talking from your head it's it's well what do i think bob wants to perceive me as like it's the walls that you're putting up that it's like okay i gotta i gotta act like this big bad person like i tell my team all the time like you know guys i'm just trying every day like, they think that me and my wife have this, like, all figured out with running this business. We don't. We just show up every day. And we're willing to take the nose or we're willing to take the, oh, crap, uh, we lost our butt today on that project because we didn't bid it right or whatever it is. But, you know, you got to push You got to push forward. And, you know, one thing that, you know, one thing that you'll learn in life is a lot of your high, highly, highly successful people, they come from a broken home or they come from a lot of diversity um not necessarily like everything was just perfect slid right over to them and there's nothing wrong if you came from a loving two parents in the home that actually loved each other and it was healthy there's nothing wrong with that because somebody can be pushed and make something 
massive of that. However, like um, what you you know you're talking about, um, I just gave you guys a, a good friend of mine's book before we started this Hunter Blues uh, Make It Count book. Mm-hmm. Um, he grew up to 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 attic as parents. Um, you know, he's taking me by the trailer that he grew up in. And when you read his book, because hopefully you read it, um, you know, he talks about, um, I hope it's in the book. I've, I've known him so long, but uh, <laughs> talks about like having to dig change out between the seats and the old car to have enough gas to get to school. And he also talks about having him drop drop him off before he gets up to the front of the line because he's embarrassed mm-hmm. to get out of that car, you know. Um, and there's certain things that, his kids will never experience because come high hell or water, like that's what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's things, there's, there's things with, for, for my family. Like I grew up, my dad, um, and I call her my egg donor because I don't think she deserves the title of mother walked out when I was two. Um, my kids will live in a house with a mom and dad that love each other, that support each other, that not saying we don't we get along every single day perfectly that she's never mad at me for putting my foot in my mouth but genuinely like at the end of the day she knows darn well that I love her I support her and I want her to I want to push her to be the best you know and same thing with my kids and Bobby Ann one of uh one of my team members yesterday somebody reached out was like hey I'm looking for a new job you know and she's like hey I'm just gonna warn you Bob doesn't sugarcoat stuff and he wants to push you professionally and personally, you know, and that's like, that's when you care, you know, and I'm going to kind of tie this into Mr. Orm, uh, my FFA advisor. One time when I was a senior, I was doing some stupid stuff that I shouldn't be doing, and I was bragging about it on, uh, it was a soil judging event, and he pulled me to the side and kind of gave me the what to. He's like, hey, quit being a DA. And uh, these younger kids are looking up to you. And uh, I've never had this conversation with them, but he kind of, um, I think he uh, I think he was so mad at me at area that as a senior, he put me with two freshmen at area contest for soil judging. And uh, I think we were the third team. And um, the two other kids, we all grew up right beside each other, literally within – a mile of each other. Um, and my one, my, my, my best friend, Kyle, we lost him in a freak accident at 19. Um, and you want to talk about how like God works everything out. Like my wife, Emily, that was her cousin. And we didn't know each other at all at that time. She grew up uh, a couple towns over, but we, we came together and like them guys finished like 20th and 21st individuals and I finished either like fourth or seventh. <laughs> so we actually beat Rushville team two <laughs> and we made it to state soul judging. <laughs> but honestly, I don't blame Mr. Warren because I was being a punk senior that just, you know, so like he loved me enough the kind of you know discipline, yeah, di- to discipline me, you know. So um, and it's like it's like your parents, like you know, you guys, you're getting there. You're you're respecting your parents more now than you did a couple oh, yeah. of years ago. Oh yeah. <laughs> now fast forward another ten or fifteen years, and when you're in my shoes, and you're like, damn, how did they do it? Like I look back from my dad, like as a single dad, like there was three kids that he was trying to feed. He was trying to go to college because he had two back surgeries and couldn't farm anymore. Like, you know, those days that I don't know how the heck I do it, and I've got a wife that supports, yeah. you know, kind of thing. So, you know, <clears throat> yeah, there's just – it takes a lot of support um, from a lot of different people. So yeah. any any good stories there where you had to get disciplined or <laughs> told that you were being an idiot or you guys good kids? I was absolutely not a good kid. Um <laughs> I guess this was this is just like school trouble. I guess um, one time I and I don't know why I did this, but I was trying to be cool, um, and I did like a burnout in my truck in the parking lot, and the administrator called me in the next day, and I was a monitor for him, so like I was like I was in his class like every day, and like helped with like getting students in there and passes or whatever, and 
I had my monitoring period already, and I get called back down there. I was like, oh, maybe I forgot something in the office, whatever. And uh, totally did not even think about it until he's like, oh, yeah, come on in, close the door. I was like, okay. And uh, he's like, you want to tell me what happened last night? And I was like, <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? And he's like, um, so it was in the parking lot. And I was like, I don't know what I did. Like, I, I genuinely didn't think of it. And he's like, all right, well, uh, I guess I'll just have to explain it to you then. <laughs> I was like, okay. And he's like, so your truck is a red Silverado, right? And I was like, yeah. He goes, okay. He's like, you can do, uh, you can probably do the burnout in that thing, can you? And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's what it is. I was like, yeah, I, that was me. I did that. I'm sorry. And he was like, all right, well, school policy says that I can't, I can't let you drive for a week. He's like, but I know you, I know like you're a good kid. It was, you know, you were just being stupid, whatever. He's like, I'm going to let you finish out this week. You can drive this week, but next week you can't. So like, he still gave me the opportunity to like make it up and still like, it was middle of the week. Um, so he, it would have been like a long period of time without driving. He's like, I'll just, you know, you can ride the bus these days, whatever, get to school. However, I don't care, but your truck can't be on the property. He's like, it can this week, but after next. And it was just like in that moment, like knowing that, the policy's in place, and, like, I have to accept, like, that, like, for what it is, but because he knew me, and he knew I was a good student, and, like, it wasn't a mistake, and I, it, I admitted to it, like, I was straight up and honest, like, yeah, like, I did, I'm sorry, and I think that's what gave me that opportunity to be, like, okay, these next two, three days that I have left of this week, I can still drive, and it won't be that big of a deal, and I still have to, you know, take my punishment, whatever, but, you know, I still had that opportunity to not have it span out over a longer period of time. And I think that's kind of something that goes into a lot of things. Like, you know, I forgot my FFA jacket one time for an event. And <laughs> this year. <laughs> this year. <laughs> and I, I just told the advisor, and it was just like, hey, like, I messed up. Like, can I do, like, can I borrow one of your jackets so I can do this event? And they're like, oh, yeah, like, that's fine. But just, like, having that initiative to be like, I messed up. I screwed up. Like, here's what it is. At first, I, I totally had no idea what I did. And I was like, oh, man. Like, I'm thinking everything through my head. And then when I realized, I was like, yeah, I did that. I'm sorry. But I think just, like, accepting, like, whatever you did for, like, what it was is something that, like, is really important and something that I learned from that moment. Well, one thing we do as a company, um, something we've kind of implemented lately, is um, we have agreements, which are kind of – what our, our what our what our thinking is behind that is it's okay to make a new agreement like if you commit to being here every day at eight o'clock then be here every day at eight o'clock it's okay to make a new agreement where it's like prime example Ellie my office girl called me this morning hey Bob what to drop um, my daughter off at the babysitter she had an appointment um, a cancer checkup appointment and her tire was flat as flat could be she's like i'm gonna leave my car here um my dad or my her her stepdad in, in a better sense is gonna swing by pick me up and drop me off the office i may be a couple minutes late i'm like perfect that's fine like thanks for the heads up it's okay to make a new agreement it's not okay to break an agreement mm -hmm. you know own your stuff you yeah. know yeah. so any good stories or were you just a really good child that you know <laughs> i mean Sometimes you, you, you know, sometimes girls are like, it's the boys that are rebellious, you know, doing stupid stuff. I would say, um, I did not, I did not really get into much trouble during high school, but I do kind of want to go back to like the broken home. Like, I mean, I'm not going to air everything, but, um, when we did that milk and meat campaign, I was going through some really rough stuff back at home and pretty much it lasted until, till now, like it, it still goes on. So like you do there's a lot of things that you've got to push through and like you said like the most successful people didn't come from great backgrounds because we had not that you know if you did come from a great background that's awesome but the kids that know what it's like to struggle um and that's i think talk about the state of our country like we as a nation like most kids don't know how to deal with tragedy and i think that's like a lot of the reason why we are here where we are now is because something happens like COVID and it just wrecks somebody's world. And for me personally, I can only speak for myself. COVID did not have that much of an effect on me. I know it did for other people, but where I was at, I was like, oh, I can't 
you go to this event, Big Whoop. And, like, I had friends that were in tears over the fact that their sports events were canceled. I'm like, if that is wrecking your world, if it takes that to ruin, you know, your outlook on life, then you have not been through, you know, a lot of a lot of things. Not not that I'm trying to be rude, but, like, I was just, like, sitting here. I was like, this is not the worst thing I'm going through right now. Um, and so I think it just – that really – um, home struggles, not that I don't want to say that I grew up, you know, horrible. It just wasn't what it should have been. Well, and, you know, and, and one thing that I always, you know, there's there's two different ways to look at it <clears throat> with, with my dad raising me. Like, um, he taught me work hard and be honest. And his philosophy was if you work hard and you're honest, you'll never have to worry about having a job. So I've tried to take it one step above that. Um, I love my dad to pieces. I owe him a ton of respect. He grew up with that, raised by his parents of like, get a job, get a safe job. And my dad had an eight to five job. And then my dad also always, um, he always did a side hustle. Well, what's called a side hustle now, you know, um, my dad's just always working, you know. I mean, he's still feeding cattle and he's in his, you know, late 60s, you know. Um, But, you know, I've taken it to work hard, be honest, and my business will be successful. You know, and, you know, like you said, like, you know, and, and, and I can I can dwell on that, you know, I didn't have the nicest this or I didn't have the nicest that. Or I can look back and very fortunate that my dad loved me enough that there was always food on the table. Yeah. Like my dad, now he's a soft teddy bear that he has grandkids. But growing up, he was an asshole. Like, I mean, I swear my dad whipped my, you know what, every day to stay in practice. Like, there were some days it was like, man, what, what am I going to get in trouble for? You know, um, now, like, I always say my my middle one, my oldest girl, Reagan, um, you would have to know her to appreciate this, but her and my dad were had shared the same birthday. And I always say that she could murder somebody. My dad would <laughs> bury that body and take it to the grave, and nobody would find out. Like, you know, but, you know, I look at that, that my dad cared. My dad pushed me. Um I was scared. Of, like, I was actually pretty well-behaved in school because, like, if I would have gotten in trouble at school, like, it would have been ten times worse when I got yeah. home from my dad, you know, where some parents didn't care. Like, you know, I look back and, and my dad was like, hey, you're going to do FFA. You know, my dad actually was like, don't waste your time with the politics in school. We don't have the last right name in this county, you know. And, you know, one thing that I like about FFA is, like, I feel like, if you put the work in it, it's not as political. Yeah, Absolutely. you get like, what you, what you know, put into it, like, what you get out of it. When you go judge livestock, it's what you, it's how you do. Like, there's no curve of like, oh, that one, I like that person, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. So, and like I said, um, you know, I the older I get, the more I just respect and appreciate my dad for what he did do. Um, he's, you know, now he's a fantastic grandpa, and he was a great dad too. You know, it's just easy when you're at that age that you're yeah. just like, oh, he could have done this better or could have done that better. Um, but now it's like, you know what? He's a ph- phenomenal father-in-law to my wife, um, great grandpa. Um, he's actually, me and my wife got invited to the Rushville banquet um, tomorrow night, and he's going to come and take the kids out to Culver's and, you know, babysit them for us. You know, so that's, you know, that's always, that's fun, you know, on this side of things. So, um, why, when we're wrapping up here, um, you guys got state convention coming up here in just a few weeks. Um, you guys all got to give a retiring speech, correct? Yep. Um, and I, I know you won't want to share what it is, but maybe, maybe a topic or, you know, what you're working on, you know, kind of thing from there. And then, you know, and also kind of give, you know, your biggest takeaway from your FFA career. Uh, for my retiring address, I don't really don't have uh, much of that thought of yet it's still kind of in the works uh for me it's it's got to like come to me naturally and that's that's how my banquet speech was when i was writing it out it was like the my topics that i was talking about were like really like hitting home i was like this is what i'm passionate about this is what i want to deliver um and that's kind of how a lot of my speeches have been this year and i think my retiring address i think it's going to come i still have you know like 40 30 40 days still so i think it'll come um i have an idea of what i want to go to um, I kind of want to talk about like embarrassing moments and how you can make the most of them. Um, and just like everybody's going to do something embarrassing at some time, like just live in that moment and just enjoy it. Um, it's kind of what I want to talk about. 
Um, <clears throat> for projects, though, um, we're bringing back the dance. Every year at the state convention, there was a dance. Um, the last two, we haven't had one. And so now we're bringing it back, and we're excited to do that. Um, dances have always been, conference dances have always been a big part of our team and something that we've really enjoyed. And so we're glad to be hosting a dance again at state convention with all the members. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm leading that up, and so I'm super excited about that. Um, but biggest takeaway from this year was probably, I think I might have to come back to that one. So can you, yeah. you think, yeah, yeah. I was like, I, I don't have to think about be, that. It can also be from just FFA in okay. general, too. Yeah. It doesn't have yeah. to be um, this year. So speaking of an embarrassment, are you going to embarrass be an embarrassment at the dance or what? I usually I got two, I got two left feet. If I'm being honest, but I try my best. Um, I would say my topic for my RA is probably the biggest thing that I got out of the year. Um, my big line is going to be finding purpose through your pain, which is very fitting uh, for what we talked about. So, how do you take like those painful moments in life and make a purpose out of them? Um, kind of similar to how like you said your wife's cousin died and that. Is that how you met her? No, no, no okay. it was a couple of years later, but yeah. it, it kind of was, yes. Um, In a way, because like, I was yeah. really close to her aunt and uncle. Like it was, it was kind of, um, it's it's all a God thing. Like yeah. there are no accidents, but like me and Kyle, like he was that buddy that you could call. Um, even if he didn't know what the hell he was doing, he would help you. And I look back, like my first house I bought, he helped us lay this um, this some flooring there. And my brother actually owns the house now. And I'd be embarrassed now that I own a contracting company to like for you to see that because like we didn't know what we were doing, but hell, we were going to try, you know. And uh, but I had become we had gotten really close and then I got really close with his mom and dad. And I mean, we were neighbors yeah. like I mean, like we rode the best the bus together, you know, sometimes we would ride home with you know, from 4-H stuff with his family, vice versa, you know. Um, and so I was really close to his mom and dad, and it it was healing for all of us, like, once he passed because it was very, very, very quick. Um, like, the accident happened Saturday, and he was gone Saturday night. So, like, it wasn't like we saw it coming, anything like that. So it, it worked out, but it's funny because uh, her aunt and uncle kept talking about me, um, and then that's how... You know, that's kind of what yeah. kind of sparked, you know, her interest. But go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, like, yeah. that's a prime example of, you know, finding it, making a painful moment. And whether that, like, I often talk about God, like, my faith is really what propels, like, my faith in Christ especially, that, you know, He is my identity. Um, my pain isn't my identity. A lot of times we go through bad things, and that's who we think we are. Um, what has been done to us is who we are, and that's a total lie. Um, that That is only going to make you better um, as a person, and you can relate to a lot more people. Like Now I have the ability to sit down with FFA members this year that went through what I went through, and I'm like, hey, it, you know, compassion is one thing, but being able to relate is a whole other. Like, I know exactly what you're feeling and what you're going through. Here's my best advice based off of what I've done, so... Awesome. Um, yeah, that's a, there's a, um, and that's actually why I'm so passionate about the Dave Ramsey, the financial stuff, because my dad and egg donor went through bankruptcy, mm -hmm. divorce. So that was, that wasn't the only problem. However, that was a big problem and the biggest, um, money finances is, is what causes the most fights and the most divorce yeah. divorces amongst parents or married people however you want to put it so like that's one thing like i said like you know i've heard a saying say make your mess your message because you know and you've got to you've got to share your story because me opening up about a broken home now had you open up now you have no idea who's going to listen to this and there's going to be an ffa member that's going to come up to you and it's going to connect to you um like that yeah. um and you know and another thing is is like but but it also goes back to that mental health thing it's like do you tell your story for sympathy and oh uh, like attention or are you genuinely telling it because you want to help somebody else and i'm not saying that you're no doing i it for hate the attention. I, and i've told them i was like i hate pity like right. i do not want people's pity it's just i've been there it's like i i one of my favorite things like i tell people i am not coming out of a 
um, place of perfection. I'm coming out of a place of experience. Yeah, like, yeah. I just I know what this is like, and I can use my story to help you. And you know, it's something about going back to like pushing through yep. and persevering. Like you know, when you've grown up in a broken home or stuff like that. Like you know, it's like. It's easier to push through. It's easier to deal with crap because you're like, you know what? You've made it through your worst day of your life. You've made it through. So, like, it's all an experience. It's all a journey. And, you know, some days our journey is going to be fun. Some days it's going to suck, you know. And you genuinely just, you know, had to push through. It came to me. Awesome. (laughs) I knew it would. (laughs) So, I think out of, like, all my biggest experiences, like, highs and lows of FFA, I think that the biggest thing that's, like, stuck with me is you can't do anything by yourself. Yep. Like, as hard as you want to, as, like, much as you can, like, even, like, your SAE, it's pretty individual. Like, on mine was turf grass management. I ran my own, like, mowing business. And my advisor was the one who talked me, like, oh, th- this is what you do for chores. Like, this is what you can do for your SAE. This is how you can start your business and things like that. And just, like, having that conversation with him, it started that. Competing in any contest, you have a team around you. You have to have those and rely on those individuals. And throughout this whole year, like, my teammates, like, have I've relied on them, like, more than anything else. And it's just crazy. Like, you can't do anything by yourself. No matter how hard you try, there's somebody who's going to be by your side or who's going to be helping you out somewhere along the way. Like, as much as you, like, don't think there is, there is. Yeah. Well, and if you don't know what SAE is, Supervised Agriculture Experience, that is something you have to do to be part of a – to be a member of FFA, um, and there's a whole different – you know, you can work for somebody, you run your own business, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's what, like – dude, I get jacked up about entrepreneurs um, – just because, like, there, that's the backbone of this country. Mm-hmm. You know, people that want to go start a lawn mowing business, or that want to go start a roofing business, or want to go start a flower business, what, whatever. You know, it's like, and you know, there is, there is a, there is a connection of like, you know, there's a whole other level of respect with another entrepreneur because it's like, you know, what they're digging. And they're clawing through the same. They're, they're having the same freaking problems as my, I'm having. They may be in a different field, you know. Yeah. So that is awesome. But no, seriously, guys, I appreciate your time. Um, you guys are you're you speaking of legacy, like the impact, the ex- internal external impact that you're gonna make um, on people's lives. Like is you have no idea, and I just hope one day that you guys will get that. Like holy cow, you know that was. I hate, I hate the people that's like, oh, I missed the good old days in high school. Literally, me and my wife are walking through the high school uh, a couple of days ago to talk to that class. And my wife's like, why do people ever want to come back here? <laughs> you know, and we're there to talk to kids. Like, we love doing that, you know. But, like, I really, uh, I hope you guys do look back and see the impact that you made on lives. Um, because, you know, you've, you've, you've impacted families that, babies that aren't even born from, like, you got, like, you drove the nice town. Last night, drove back to Trafalgar and drove back to Rushville today. Like, you could have slept on my couch or, <laughs> and the uh, futon in here. But, no, seriously, thank you guys for coming. Um, I appreciate you guys. And I'm, I'm, I'm always here cheering you guys on no matter what. And I'm genuinely always here for if you guys ever need support. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. As well as the roofs. <laughs> <laughs> the covers.